Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York. To our audience worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. The Senate approved that $2 trillion spending package yesterday, and now it's time for the House. Something I will be speaking to Speaker Nancy Pelosi about exclusively later in this hour. To bring you up to speed in the meantime, we welcome now our Bloomberg Chief Washington Correspondent. He is Kevin Cirilli. So, Kevin, tell us about this package, and is it going to be approved tomorrow in the House? Yes, it is. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi headlines crossing the Bloomberg terminal virtually as we speak that she says now that this vote is going to happen with strong bipartisan support, David, on Friday. So the House now, according to the Speaker, is saying that there is going to be this vote on Friday and that she expects it with strong bipartisan support. We should note that the Senate within the last 24 hours really giving no wiggle room for any progressives in the House to dissent on a resounding 96 to 0 vote in the Senate. The Senate was able to send it to Speaker Pelosi. So again, uh, the big vote happening tomorrow, this just breaking now. I very much look forward, David, to your interview with her. It's going to be fascinating to see what she has to say. As do I. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, there's a lot of talk already in Washington about the next one, number four, I guess it would be, in spending package. How long is it going to be before we see Congress back together again to act on anything? Uh, I asked that to a congressman yesterday, Congressman French Hill, and he gave me the timetable of 60 days, David. Uh, he says that he wants to see, and the conversations that they want to see happen are to see how this stimulus, which is 10% of gross domestic product, and see how this stimulus impacts uh, Americans, and also to get an update on the health care concerns of this uh, and see within the next two months whether or not America can get around this virus and be able to bring it into place. Uh, but from his vantage point and uh, other conversations that I had yesterday, sometime out in the next two months, uh, and potentially some more wiggle room for financial institutions, that could be the next piece of this, but it's a bit too premature at this particular point to go to, to go to predict out. Yeah, fair enough. We need that $2 trillion first. Okay, thanks so much yeah. to Kevin Sorelli. Yeah. He's our chief Washington correspondent. And as Kevin mentioned, later this hour, we're going to have a live interview with the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. She'll be joining us at 1140 Eastern Time. And as we wait for the spending package to be finalized, we're starting to get some numbers indicating the sort of economic damage the coronavirus is doing to the economy. Jobless claims jumped by nearly 3.3 million people last week. That is five times the prior record increase. To put this in a broader perspective, we welcome now Ellen Hughes Cromwick. She's third way senior resident fellow. Ms. Hughes Cromwick served earlier as chief economist in the Department of Commerce under President Obama and before that as chief global economist for Ford Motor Company, including during that 2009 great financial crisis. She comes to us by way of Skype from Ann Arbor, Michigan. So welcome, really good to have you with us. Give us a sense about Thank these you, jobless numbers. I mean, they spiked way up, but some people say, no, we may be looking at 10 million before we're done here. Yeah, I think this is really the, the heart of the crisis that we're seeing. You know, when you have a shutdown of the economy, this is way beyond what we would tend to see. This is a shock to the economy and it's a shock to people. So we're going to see more of this, unfortunately. I think the stimulus package, and that really isn't the right word for what we've seen, but the package that was just passed is going to help. But we've got a long way to go here. Long way to go, and it's awfully hard to know exactly what to expect, how to even get numbers yeah. around it. We had J.P. Morgan earlier today coming out and saying <laughs> in the second quarter they might see GDP going down by 25 percent. Are these economic numbers reliable at this point? How can we know right now? No, I, I think you're right, David, to point out we really don't know. I think the economic forecasters are doing the best they can under the circumstances. I mean, frankly, we've never had this kind of shutdown. And we don't know what the health consequences are as we see this ripple through, you know, various regions in the country. So these are guesses at this point. I think for all intents and purposes, you know, we're in a shutdown mode. And we've got to get beyond that. This package that they passed is going to help help us. And as you point out, first and foremost, this is a health crisis. There are people's lives on the line, which is the most important priority. We have to get past that, try to get that under control before we can really address the economy. At the same time, is the fact that this is so different from any other situation like this, could it possibly, just as a possibility, be better news for us? I mean, I heard somebody say today they've never seen a recession declared by decree, which is essentially what we've done here. We've said we're going to shut down the economy. Um, I don't think any shutdown, you know, whatever we want to call it, is a good thing. So right off the bat, we're in a very difficult situation. What we do know is that the Fed responded very rapidly. We have a playbook on the Fed side. 
They've launched these liquidity facilities. They're willing to do whatever it takes. That systematic approach from the Fed is a big positive. Now we got to turn and look to the future of shock-proofing our economy and figuring out what is our fiscal plan. We've had too many shocks. We got to get beyond that and prepare in advance. Well, on the fiscal plan, uh, and part of it is that $2 trillion. As you look at it, because you have had experience with this in the past, both in private sector and in the public sector, where do we need to get the money to the fastest? What's the critical point at this point? Yeah, you know, I remember that uh, terrible situation we had in the financial crisis as companies just continued to lay off workers. When I was at Ford, we had to lay off thousands of workers. Look at GM. They were hun over 100,000 workers. That's what we want to avoid. We don't want to go through that again. That's why I think the way they put the package together to make sure that they're helping companies not lay off per people, we can't go through that again. We've got to get to a point where people stay on payrolls. This wasn't their fault. So we've got to keep people on payrolls. That is critically important. Talk about the auto industry a bit, because you know that so terribly well, having been, I think, 18 years at Ford Motor Company. Uh, it was not having a great time before this all happened. Now we see downgrades of debt. We saw Ford, your old company, actually go to junk status, uh, a yeah. fallen angel, as it's called. Uh, does there need to be a bailout uh, again of the auto industry? Well, I think we're going to be looking at some kind of support for many industries, and autos is certainly one of them. As we look ahead, you know, these companies are really transforming. They're moving to electrified vehicles. They're moving ahead in a very competitive world. We don't want our companies to be at a disadvantage. So I think any future help has got to really address that. At the same time, we tend to talk <clears throat> to... Me. I'm No, not at all. It's great to have you with us. We tend to talk about the very large companies, the Fords, the Boeings, things like that. Uh, but an awful lot of employment in this country really comes from small and medium-sized enterprises. They can't, a lot of them, afford to keep their employees on the payroll until the government check comes. What can we do for them? Right. I mean, they've got to get that money out as quickly as possible. You're, you're absolutely right, David. We can't let a minute go by. This is an extremely urgent situation. We don't want to be in a position where small businesses have to lay off people because of a health crisis. That is on our watch, and we can't let that happen. So that money has got to get out very, very quickly. They can't, there's not a minute to lose right now. Uh, you mentioned the, the, Federal, the Federal Reserve earlier and what they've done. Uh, there's part of this $2 trillion package that actually links up, as I understand it, the Treasury with the Federal Reserve. That is to say, gives the Treasury some money they can put forward to have the first risk loss, to, which really allows the Fed to loan a lot more money. Is that money that could get, be gotten out into the economy relatively quickly? Oh, I think so. I mean, you know, they're going to launch some Main Street lending program. Chair Powell was talking about, you know, doing whatever it takes. They're ready to go. And I think they can get funds out very rapidly. And that's going to be critical. So the issue here right now is speed. We have a crisis. We had a shock. We got to get out very rapidly. Everybody get your running shoes on. We got to move quickly. And then we got to look ahead and we got to say, how do we shock proof our economy, our people going forward? I mean, we're going to have to really take some new pages out of the book and get going on this. We can't let these shocks really debilitate our people, our workforce. Are you encouraged by the speed shown thus far in Washington or are you, does it give you pause? Well, I think, you know, we had a little bit of a hiccup there. You know, this is a huge package, $2.2 trillion. I mean, as an economist, who would have ever thought we'd be in this situation? I guess now we should expect that we're going to need this kind of quick support. So, yes, they turned this around pretty rapidly. Um, as for the health support and all those actions, I can't say as an economist, I'm a little concerned that we're not maybe shutting down more, as some of the health experts suggest. You know, we've got to really cauterize this and move ahead. So Congress is moving rapidly, and they've got to now be pivoting and thinking, what's next? Because we've got to get to a point where 
we have stimulus, not just a package mm -hmm. to stem a crisis, but we're going to need stimulus ahead. Okay, Ellen, I really appreciate you being with us today. It was truly helpful. That's Ellen Hughes-Cromwick. She is Third Way Senior Resident Fellow. And now it's time to get to check on the markets. And for that, of course, we turn to Taylor Riggs. Interesting tone here today. You're seeing the buying in equities and the buying over in bonds as well as you're trying to assess sort of uh, the fallout of the stimulus and of course the record unemployment claims that we saw today. Uh, interesting to note at a 2560 on the S&P we're right at the low end of the range of where strategists are forecasting us to end. So strategists on the street still think that there's a lot of room to the upside here as we go into the second half of the year, of course, for the S&P 500. But with the, the bond market as well, you're getting uh, still uh, uh, catching a bid there as that spawn price higher yield lower utilities are interesting. They always benefit from uh, lower rates given they're generally the more indebted companies. If we assume from all this printing you get hyperinflation and that's a huge if uh, your debt isn't worth anything. So I guess the utilities are one of the best performers today and then crude of course you can't get inflation when crude's at $23 a barrel. So that isn't going anywhere. So you're sort of seeing interesting a sector by sector basis. David. Yeah particularly the sectors that think they might get a bailout. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Well, and if you flip up the board and take a look at Boeing, for yeah. example, you were up 92% in four days on Boeing. Of course, we know it wasn't necessarily called out by name, uh, but there was $17 trillion yeah. led to companies that benefit from national security. Boeing, yeah. of course, could be included in that. That's what the government bailout will do for you, I guess. Okay, thanks so much to Taylor Rigg. Coming up, we're going to have an exclusive interview with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. That's coming up later this hour. And this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Ritika Gupta for Bloomberg First Word News. Thanks, David. Now it's up to the House of Representatives. The House is set to vote tomorrow on that historic bailout package. The $2 trillion measure was approved unanimously in the Senate. Its goal, to keep families and companies afloat during the economic crisis caused by the coronavirus pandemic. The package includes an unprecedented injection of loans, tax breaks and direct payments. Bloomberg's learned that two Tesla employees have tested positive for the coronavirus. That's according to an internal email. The two staffers had been working from home for almost two weeks and were not symptomatic when they were in the office. According to the memo, it did not say where the employees work. U.S. prosecutors reportedly will charge Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro, with drug trafficking. That's according to the New York Times. The Times says the charges are being brought after an investigation in Washington, New York and Florida. And UBS CEO Sergio Ermotti says clients are starting to invest again. He tells Bloomberg that those with cash are looking at the credit markets having a large pool of cash available uh, during the major correction has helped uh, uh, investors to uh, uh, manage the situation in a in a in a in a you know in a in a, an effective way we do see people uh, 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 taking advantage of uh, new opportunities for example uh, this is time in our point of view to move into credits. Uh, if you look at historically from a, a risk reward standpoint of view uh, there was not not many times in the history where credit has been priced so attractively uh, and, and therefore we, we see people taking advantage of that. Amati says he's glad that for once banks are not part of the problem. He says UBS is trying to be part of the solution. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks very much, Ritika. Coming up here, we're going to have an exclusive interview with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi on that House stimulus bill, the House voting on the stimulus bill passed by the Senate yesterday. That's coming up later in this hour, and this is Bloomberg.
This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. The coronavirus is not just a national problem. It's a truly global pandemic requiring a global response, led in many ways by the World Health Organization. And the UN Foundation is seeking to support the WHO with a new COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. Welcome now CEO of the UN Foundation. She is Ambassador Elizabeth Cousins, who's heading the effort. So welcome, Madam Ambassador. It's great to talk to you over the telephone. Give us a sense of what this response fund is. Well, thank you so much, David. And first of all, I really hope that you and your loved ones are all safe and well. And please, it's Elizabeth. It's great to talk to you. Um, first, this pandemic is truly unprecedented as a global crisis in its speed and scale. And we're seeing that every day, every hour. It will impact every country. It will impact every community. There's not a dimension of our lives that will be uh, unaffected. And it needs a truly unprecedented response as a result. We started hearing from all the constituencies that the UN Foundation has worked with over the years, from businesses, from foundations, from individual advocates, from celebrity influencers and athletes, the desire to try to help. And meanwhile, we know the needs are great and we know the needs are growing. So we got together with the World Health Organization, which is an agency of the United Nations, uh, as well as a European partner called the Swiss Philanthropy Foundation, to create a new kind of fund that would allow everyone everywhere to contribute to response. And that's how the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund was born. We launched it just 10 days ago, uh, and in 10 days, we are nearly at $100 million. We've oh. seen an extraordinary outpouring of generosity from all quarters of the world. I was dying to be able to tell you we're at $100 million. We're so close, <laughs> but we're getting there. Um, and the diversity of response has been incredible. We have had almost 200,000 people donating an average of $27 on platforms like Facebook and Google and the website. We've had dozens of companies from all sectors step up, GSK, Facebook, City, uh, Verizon, TikTok, uh, Walmart Foundation. We've had the NBA and FIFA. Um, we've had celebrities like John Legend having concerts in their homes so that they can drive funds to uh, this uh, to this solidarity response fund. Uh, companies are even starting employee giving campaigns. So we've just been overwhelmed by the generosity out there, the fellow feeling and the sense that as large and big as this crisis is, we all can do something about it, and this just gives people a way to do that. So, Elizabeth, I originally understood that the target was $100 million. It sounds like you're almost there. Are you going to change that target? Oh, no. The target, <laughs> we want to go as far as we need to go. I mean, the needs for this um, uh, pandemic response are significant. The the first wave of effort was uh, around the first generation of a strategic preparedness and response plan prepared by the World Health Organization to guide the global public health response. They're now in the process of revising that with a view to a wider and larger spectrum of needs. We know that the needs are significant, and so we will keep going until this is done, and we'll do our part to contribute to the most urgent uh, gaps and needs that there are in the WHO's frontline response. So, Elizabeth, if you, if you know at this point, take us that next step. I mean, as I understand it, this money all goes to the WHO. Originally, you said it's going to go for advisory and really supervisory functions of the WHO, but now you're going to take another step to other needs. What sorts of things are you thinking about? Well, it's already going to the full spectrum of needs that are part of the frontline response. So already um, WHO has been able to get um, masks and gloves and gowns to nearly 70 countries. That's the personal protective equipment we all now mm -hmm. know by its acronym. They've been able to get lab supplies to 120 countries for testing. You know, they've been able to create a training module for how to deal with COVID-19 in six languages that has already been accessed by 300,000 people around the world. So. It's an all-spokes effort, and, uh, and that's the effort they're leading. They're also um, directing funds when needed to other partners who are part of that response, whether they're other partners in the U.N. system or organizations that do work on R&D and innovation and the whole therapeutics agenda, which is so, so crucial, too. Elizabeth, the need is enormous, but I wonder where it's the greatest globally, and that's just not, not a question of what the need is locally, but also its current ability, the local government, to take care of it. Where is the greatest disparity where you have real problems, but the local operation can't really handle it? Well, I think, first of all, we're all seeing disparities everywhere because um, this is something that none of us have ever had to deal with before at any level. So I think that's important for everybody to recognize. One of the big worries is what will happen when COVID-19 really strikes some of the most vulnerable places around the world, countries that have weaker health systems, countries that have conflict and crisis or large numbers of displaced populations. I mean, these are people who 
can't do social distancing. They often lack access to water or basic hygiene supplies. So we have another wave of this crisis coming when we see this virus hit populations that are that much at risk. Fascinating. So, so uh, does this just keep going for the duration, as we call it now? We're in it. We're in it for the long haul. We're in it for the short haul, medium haul, long haul, whatever it takes. And we're just so uh, grateful to be able to contribute in a way that we know any gift that comes to this fund goes directly to the World Health Organization, and it goes for those most urgent needs. And anybody can contribute. It's really easy. You can go to COVID19ResponseFund.org. Uh, there are frequently asked questions that tell you any number of other ways to right. give, whether it's text uh, text giving, whether it's donating on the Facebook page. Right. Um, we're just uh, eager to allow people to give when they can contribute. Elizabeth, thanks so much. And come back and report on further developments as they occur. That's Ambassador Elizabeth Cousins. She's the CEO of the UN Foundation. As we talk about the global response to the coronavirus, there's a red headline crossing the Bloomberg even as we speak. China will be suspending foreigners' entry starting this Saturday, according to the embassy. So apparently China is shutting down its borders to foreign Nurse entry. Kayla Lines is here to report on markets, but there's a lot more than just markets to report on. Well, absolutely. And of course, all of this factors into the markets. We didn't see much reaction to that headline. We are right around the highs of the session. The major average is higher by about 4% or more here in the U.S. Of course, we do get these constant reminders from market participants that not only is the coronavirus COVID-19 spreading, but the reinfection issue is one that we have to pay attention to. But I think what you're seeing and really what you've seen for the past three days, as this is the third consecutive day that we are higher, is that the market market is betting that all of the stimulus measures, that $2 trillion waiting to be signed off on on Capitol Hill, is going to offset this at least enough well, that you can buy. Again, it's a health crisis, first and foremost, but talking right. about the markets particularly, I mean, the question is, can we have a three-peat, right? We had two back-to-back, right. -back <laughs> and a three-peat would be really encouraging. And it sort of, it looks like it's belying the notion of buying the rumors, selling the fact. Because this morning, people were saying that's what's going on, the markets are going to weaken. Not so far. Well, it looked a little testy overnight and really yeah. mostly throughout the morning. It's interesting when we saw things really turn and we got a firmer footing in equities was when we got a record initial jobless claims number, 3.3 million, and the market didn't even blink an eye. I think what that tells you is that that was really expected. It was priced in. We knew it was going to be bad. Is not only a, a, a cyclical thing, but there are literally economies all across the country that have totally shut down state by state. And so I think the market was expecting it, and it's betting that the stimulus is going to be able to offset it, at least to a certain degree. We can all hope. Okay, thank you so much to Kayla Lance for that report on the markets. Coming up, we're going to discuss what we collectively learned about the coronavirus and the race for a vaccine with Dr. Kathleen Neuzel uh, from the University of Maryland. Also ahead, an exclusive interview with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. This is Bloomberg. From New York, this is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Ritika Gupta. Thanks, David. It's the largest economic rescue in U.S. history. The Senate has approved a $2 trillion package aimed at stopping the financial damage caused by the coronavirus outbreak. The vote was 96 to 0. More than 150 million American households will receive checks, and giant loan programs have been set up to help businesses. The House is expected to vote on the bill tomorrow. India has unveiled a $22.6 billion stimulus package. The measures will include cash transfers as well as food security. Migrant workers will be among those receiving help. India is on a total lockdown for three weeks. It could be more than two months before we find out if an experimental vaccine for the coronavirus is effective. The vaccine is being developed by Moderna. A trial in 45 healthy people is being run by the National Institute of Health. Moderna told investors the vaccine could be available to some patients, such as healthcare workers, under emergency authorization in the fall. Negative interest rates have taken hold in Europe, but the CEO of Swiss bank UBS hopes it doesn't happen in the U.S. Bloomberg spoke with Sergio Amotti. I hope uh, that the U.S. will never go into a, zero, a negative rates environment because it's a very difficult place to get out from. And, uh, and uh, in, in, in a sense, I think that uh, uh, the, uh, the pumping of liquidity and, and the fiscal policy that were uh, taken so far are 
the exact uh, uh, measures to be taken. When the situation recovers, when we see better time, of course, uh, uh, lower rates are, are going to help to stimulate uh, the economy. I don't think that negative rates are the recipe to, for the U.S. Meanwhile, Amati also said that this crisis, banks are proving to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Ritika. At the center of every effort to stem the carnage done by the coronavirus and then begin to recover is the virus itself and what we can do about it. Welcome now, Dr. Kathleen Neuzel. She's director of the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. So, Dr. Neuzel, thank you so much for joining us. Let's start with the virus. What have we learned about it? So, this virus has only been known to us for less than four months. So, it's really unprecedented how much we have learned about this virus in such a short period of time. We know it's a, a coronavirus. We know it's related to viruses that, that cause the, the common cold. It's also related to the virus SARS, which caused much more severe disease in, in a outbreak uh, a little more than 15 years ago. So if in fact uh, SARS caused more severe diseases, why are we having a pandemic of this level? Is it because it's more contagious? Yes, this virus, again, we, we continue to learn every day, but this virus does appear to be more contagious than SARS or, or MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Res Respiratory Syndrome virus. Um, neither of those appear to be as transmissible as this virus. So it's both transmissible and also has the ability to cause severe disease. You're an expert on vaccines. We hear a lot about vaccines uh, and we always get our hopes up, but at the same time, we're told it'll be some good long time, 18 months or more. What is your estimate about the development of a vaccine for this coronavirus? Well, I will say that the current vaccine in, in clinical trials, which you just mentioned on your program, the mRNA vaccine that's being tested in partnership with Moderna, NIH, and, and other collaborators, went into clinical trials in an unprecedented amount of time. Within two months of having the sequence to this virus, we had built a vaccine and, and were testing it in humans. That took a lot of collaboration by many partners, including the FDA, and all partners are committed to continue to have these unprecedented timelines. So we're really hoping we can shorten both with this vaccine and other vaccines that we'll see entering trials very soon, that we can shorten those traditional timelines. Even if we shorten them, though, as a practical matter, is that for the next round if it comes? It would be for the next round when it comes, but again, we know because of the economy, because of human health, social mitigation, these, these community measures will only go so far. So in parallel, we have to be working on medical, pharmaceutical measures, drugs, vaccines that can, can stem this pandemic. Uh, short of a vaccine, talk about treatment. Uh, we've heard from the President of the United States and others about two drugs out there currently, one dealing with malaria, one dealing with Ebola that I guess have at least some promise. What, is, what do you think the prospects are for getting those in position to really affect treatment for people who have the disease? Well, the good news is the trials are underway right now. And because there are so many cases, again, we will likely get answers for those drugs faster than we ordinarily would. So I would expect and hope that within a couple months, we would have answers on the drugs as well. As you consider either a vaccine or a, a, a plan of treatment, how critical is it that we have testing, either the population more broadly or of people, for example, who have had the disease? Yeah, as you've heard, testing is, is absolutely critical. It's absolutely critical for many reasons. It's, it's critical to inform our medical care, our treatment, our enrollment of these patients into these critical clinical trials. It will be important for our, our testing of vaccines and our ability to see how vaccines work in, in the face of antibody or lack of antibody. And obviously, it helps us keep people at home when we know that, that they have the virus and have been infected. As best you can determine, what sort of level of testing do we need to have? 
I mean, is it hundreds of thousands of people? Is it millions of people? What do we really need to do to really get our arms around this from a public health point of view? Yeah, right now, I think, again, it, it's a very local decision. We certainly need enough tests for anyone who's sick, anyone who's been exposed to people who are sick, and of course, our healthcare workers. And here is one thing that people don't always consider about testing. If I'm tested today and I'm negative, it doesn't mean that I won't mm -hmm. contract the virus next week or the week after. So for healthcare workers that are constantly exposed to this virus or others that may be in positions where they are exposed to this virus, we may need to do frequent testing on, on those populations. So multiple tests per person may be necessary. So that sounds daunting, I must say. Uh, are you confident that we as a country and frankly our government is mobilizing enough forces to get that kind of testing in a position to happen? I think we can get there. You know, again, this has been a very short timeline for this, this pandemic. And we're seeing communities in, in Seattle, they've ramped up their testing, for example, in, in an incredible fashion. So we know it can be done. It's going to take uh, collaboration. It's gonna take the private sector working with the public sector. But in the same way that, that we had this vaccine being tested in an unprecedented time period, we can do the same thing with testing. Okay, doctor, really appreciate your being with us today. It was truly helpful. That's Dr. Kathleen Newsel from Thank University you. of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore. Up next, an exclusive interview with the Speaker of the House. Nancy Pelosi will join me to talk about the stimulus plan and much more. This is Bloomberg. We welcome now our audiences for both Bloomberg Television and Radio Worldwide. I'm David Weston. The Senate passed a massive $2 trillion stimulus package late last night, and now the legislation to combat the economic fallout from the coronavirus moves over to the House. For more on that vote, we welcome now the Speaker of the House. She is Nancy Pelosi, joining us live from Capitol Hill for an exclusive interview. So, Madam Speaker, thank you very much for being with us on a very busy day. Really appreciate it. Let's start with the logistics. You. Do you have any doubts that this will get passed, and when do you think it will get passed in the House? No doubts whatsoever. Uh, tomorrow morning, oh, last night, our distinguished majority leader, Mr. Hoyer, uh, gave notice to members when the Senate bill passed uh, that we would be coming to the floor uh, on Friday morning. Uh, we have to give 24 hours notice of bringing a bill to the floor. And so that will be Friday morning, and it will be uh, a, a lively, a, a wonderful debate. Uh, we're very proud of the legislation. We'll have a strong bipartisan vote and hopefully by noon we'll be finished. That will only depend on how uh, carefully we have to come in in, uh, in small numbers to the floor of the House to vote. Uh, but our debate will be finished and uh, we're very proud of it. Uh, we're very proud of the legislation because we believe that many elements of the House Democratic bill were contained in the Senate bill. It helped uh, support the Senate Democrats who really we did jujitsu on the Republican bill. It was very corporate oriented. This is worker focused. Uh, and so we're very pleased with that. And Madam Speaker, just to change the leverage, just to change the leverage. As you know, Madam Speaker, there, were, there was a lot of impatience to get this done when we thought we had it, we didn't have it. But it was held up for some of those issues that you're talking about that makes you prouder than you otherwise would have been. What's the most number one thing or two things that really you think improved because of the delay of a couple of days? Well, let me just say it wasn't held up and it wasn't a delay. Uh, we saw a $2 trillion bill last Saturday. Uh, this is the legislative process. We have to see what it is and see how we can weigh in to get a, co a, a compromise uh, that works for the American people. So we actually should have been doing this over a much longer period of time where we'd have more transparency and the public could be more aware of the provisions in the bill. Uh, so this was a very accelerated pace as it was. Uh, but what we needed to do was to change it from corporate trickle down to worker bubble up. And in that way, it said that we do recognize that certain industries are going to need federal funds. And we want those, those industries to know that we have, there are conditions 
uh, to make sure that workers are protected, that they stay employed, that they're on the payroll, and that their, their rights are protected. It's very important. Strong infusion of funds for small business, we're very excited about that, and that is, for the first time, some grants in small business uh, administration, or, and that process facilitate it greatly to aid small businesses, which are, as you know, the lifeblood of our economy, the job creators, the wealth creators, so very, very important. So again, uh, many of these changes that changed it from trickle down to bubble up uh, took a, a, a matter of 48 or so hours. But that would not be called a delay. That would be called an improvement. Fair, fair enough. Uh, let's talk about small businesses for a moment, because as you say, they really employ a lot of the people in the country. We've seen a lot of layoffs already at things like restaurants and things. How confident are you that that money can get to those small businesses? Larger businesses have more capital. They can tide it over and keep people on payroll. Smaller ones can't. Small Business Administration, are they up to that task? Well, it, I, I just actually this morning spoke with the Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Treasury, Mr. Mnuchin, and we have been talking about this for a while, uh, that we cannot let, leave it up to the process of the SBA. Uh, the, there's an uh, initiative that he put forward that the banks could do the direct lending with the imprimatur of the SBA, and that would make this all go very much faster. And that's, that will be a vast improvement, really. Uh, necessary because of the urgency of getting those funds into the hands of, of the uh, small businesses. And actually, there's also a loan forgiveness in there in terms of rent and utilities and the rest, depending on how uh, a business thrives with the resources that they receive in a loan. You mentioned also the oversight that's now in this bill, as I understand it, for some of the disbursements to the larger corporations. Some might call it a bailout. Is that oversight after the fact, or will it be advanced consultation so they'll be able to say, no, it shouldn't be going to that company, or do you have to wait for it to go out and then afterwards remonstrate with them? Well, there are a couple different categories. For example, the airline industry has a very direct formula that part of the money, uh, nearly 50-50, but part of the money goes in loans to uh, to to the airlines and part of it goes in grants because that goes directly to the employees and that is the condition there. This money just touches base there but goes directly to the employees to keep them employed. Uh, and then the other funds do have their conditions about no buybacks, no dividends, no bonuses, all of that kind of uh, uh, provisions because people felt very burned about what happened uh, in, in uh, 2008, 2009. But it is, um, uh, in terms of the uh, bigger pot, which, which is at the, largely the discretion of the administration, uh, we, we insisted that there be uh, an uh, oversight on that, and that was in our House bill and in the Senate bill. And it said that for the funds that would be released in that process, uh, that there would be an, an inspector general uh, to oversee, have oversight over that process, and in addition to that, a five-person panel of Cong that Congress appoints uh, to oversee how that money goes out as well. Uh, this is absolutely essential. It could not be, for example, with all due respect to the Secretary, he could put out money. We wouldn't even know about it until f six months later who may have gotten it, whether it was appropriate in, the, uh, in terms of the priority it should have at this time where the lives and the livelihood of the American people are at stake. There are different regional points of view about that and uh, just uh, the role of government points of view. Uh, but we want every, you know, again, we don't want to keep any resources from anybody who really needs it in order to, again, uh, help our economy grow at, at this time. But it really has to be coronavirus specific. That has been our condition from day one. This is our third bill. Our first bill was about emergency. Our second bill was about emergency. Our third bill, which is this bill, is about mitigation, trying to, to mitigate for the damage that is being done to our economy, as well as continue to meet the emergency health needs of the American people. Our next bills will lean toward recovery, uh, how we can create good-paying jobs as we go forward, perhaps building the infrastructure of America. All of these things are, are being done in a bipartisan way. But we do have to 
uh, weigh in to make sure the leverage is more equal rather than uh, favoring trickle down rather than bubble up from the workers. Right, we are speaking of course with the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Let's talk about that next bill that you referred to, whenever it may come. Uh, what sorts of things are you looking at? For example, I've talked to some people up on the Hill who say this is a time for infrastructure. That may be part of the recovery you refer to. Are you starting to think about what sorts of things would help with that recovery? Well, we still have a little bit of unfinished business from the two previous bills. For example, in the first bill we said testing, 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 free testing for everyone, and then next bill masks, masks, masks to facilitate that. However, uh, what we want to do and has not been provided for yet in the two bills is to make sure that uh, the funds that are required to cover the cost of testing. It's not just the test, it's the doctor visit and the rest, and we don't want anyone uh, to be getting a high deductible because they were responsible in responding to the uh, requirement that they be tested for those who are required to be tested. In addition to that, family medical leave is not as inclusive as it needs to be to cover the needs of America's working families. In terms of what we do want to see more direct payments, we had much higher direct payments in both our health, in our House bill, and we would hope to see that, that we can do that again because that is really very necessary. Uh, another thing, there's just some other things that relate to pensions. We had a pension provision in the bill that President Trump supported, but Senator McConnell wouldn't do and said we'll do it in the next bill because the pension security uh, of America's working families is essential. Uh, to the strength of our economy, and now with this siege of the coronavirus, even more so. Uh, then there's one that is very particular to the District of Columbia. Uh, for some reason, the Republicans in the Senate decided that they would not treat the district as a state, as it has always been in the distribution of resources, but treat them, treat them as a territory. And, and it was at the great disadvantage of the District of Columbia and a cause of great concern for the members of Congress, House and Senate from this region, to name a few. But again, to move on to the um, infrastructure, we're already, and again, that has never been partisan. That has always been a bipartisan initiative to build the infrastructure of America. It's a public health issue for clean air, clean water. It's a commercial, uh, it's a business issue. It's, it's a, an economic issue to uh, move right. commerce and uh, grow jobs and all the rest. And the list goes on. You yeah. know how important it is. So maybe some infrastructure coming up? Well, I would hope so. Uh, our next bill may be just a, a very important piece that I didn't mention is state and local government is going to need much, much more uh, infusion of cash. Uh, they're just not going to be able to meet the needs. My state of California had a big surplus, but we're spending it off. Our governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, is spectacular and, and, and very, shall we say, careful in spending. But again, this is, uh, this is a challenge beyond any, anything we've ever seen before. Same thing with Governor Cuomo in New York, but other, other states as well. Uh, this, is, uh, this is like, as I say, something we haven't seen before, so we have to be prepared. I would hope that some of that funding could come from the Fed in expanded lending opportunities, and we did allow for that in the legislation that was passed last night in the Senate, and that we will pass enthusiastically in a bipartisan way on Friday morning after giving 24 hours notice to our right. members to show up in Washington. Okay, Madam Speaker, thank you so very much for taking time out on a very important day because you have a very important piece of legislation. It's also your birthday, so happy birthday. That thank is you. House Speaker you so Nancy much. Pelosi. Thank you for joining us for Bloomberg Television and radio audiences worldwide. And we welcome now one of those who will be voting on that bill. He is Representative Patrick McHenry, Republican of North Carolina, who is the ranking Republican member on the House Financial Services Committee. He joins us by phone from North Carolina. So thank you for your patience, Mr. Congressman. And we were talking with the House Speaker, as you heard. Give us your sense about where this bill is. Do you agree with her? It's definitely going to get passed and it's going to definitely get passed tomorrow morning. Yes, I believe the, president's, the president will have it signed into law before... Uh, before business opens on Monday, and uh, we'll get these programs up and running and get the relief to the American people that, that so desperately need it. Are you confident you can get there fast enough? We talked, for example, with the Speaker a little bit about the SBA, the Small Business Administration. Uh, are we sure that the machinery is there to get cash into people's hands? Well, look, I, I wish that we uh, had, had gotten this bill passed uh, uh, over the weekend rather than uh, it being strung out all week. You see the, the jobless claims have soared. It's five mm. times worse than the worst 
uh, job uh, uh, job numbers we've ever seen. Um, and uh, and so I wish we'd gotten this bill passed five days ago rather than the haggling that has gone on that has just driven the price tag up but not the relief numbers up. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, American people need this done quickly. Um, I, I have concerns about uh, the capacity of the federal government in terms of technology, mm-hmm. and that's why I've worked intently to have redundancy in programs. So if the SBA can't deliver, we need the Treasury to deliver and the Treasury to deliver with the Federal Reserve uh, rather than just at, allow one agency of government to f- bear the brunt of the relief mechanism. We also so sp- we're working on those redundancy issues. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. We also spoke with the Speaker about what might come next. She said recovery. Do you have it on your back of your mind that there will be another bill here, another, perhaps massive spending on things like infrastructure? Well, let's see what happens. I, I, see, I, I see a lot of people in Washington desperate for more action uh, for their pet priorities. Mm. I think we've got to see what the needs are of the American people. If we can get through the next couple of weeks without uh, having a crushing debt load on small businesses across the country, then in the summer months, once we get past uh, uh, these these rising number of, of coronavirus cases, once we bend this curve, and actually get the cases reduced, people can emerge into normal economic life, normal life in America, and that normal life of America will be a strong economy, uh, getting back to the normal business of of America. I think those things can happen without government action. Uh, I think what we're doing right now is responding like this is a natural disaster, uh, and that means getting people stood back up and getting back on their feet. So you, you put your finger on what everyone seems to agree is a critical issue here is the smaller businesses that employ an awful lot of people in this country, the restaurants and other small businesses. What about down there in North Carolina? What are you t- hearing from, what are you telling to the small businesses there, the little restaurants that have to lo- lay off their people? When, how long do they have to wait? Well, I, I, I'm saying that it's going to be a week to 10 days uh, before they can, they can uh, access SBA programs. But they can immediately go to their community bankers once this bill is signed into law, those uh, community banks, those banks of all sizes, will have greater capacity to work with people to structure their loans to get them through the, this cash crunch in the next uh, uh, month to, to three months that they're experiencing. I worry much more about those small business folks than uh, the businesses of the largest size. The business, businesses of the largest size have different credit facilities they can access. But a small business person, somebody who has a daycare, somebody right. who is a, uh, has a dry cleaner or somebody who's cleaning other people's homes, yeah. they're the ones that are being severely yeah. impacted, and those are the ones that, who desperately need relief. No question, and we hope it's coming for them. Thank you so much to Congressman Patrick McHenry. He's the ranking Republican of the House Financial Services Committee. Coming up on Balance of Power, we're going to continue on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we'll talk about the stimulus package and its impact on business with Neil Bradley. He's chief policy officer at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg.